Um, we have one second here, our nonprofit Respect Ed, um, and Jade and Maya are here. You're about to hear from them. Thank you for bearing with us. Um, so Respect Ed is a local nonprofit and they are going to um, walk their participants through consent, staying safe, dealing with sexual assault, gender expression, and respecting gender diversity at the country fair and other festivals. We'll have, um, they'll have interactive nuanced discussions about the fair's policies and how to cover these topics with your kids. So next time we are in person, we can have the best fair yet. And Respect Ed is a nonprofit organization run by and for young people working to provide students with the tools they need to set the standards for their own health and education. We believe that early and accurate education around sexuality and consent allows youth to lead healthier, safer lives. And with their support, students can successfully advocate for and help realize the education they deserve. So let me spotlight them here and bring them into the conversation. We are very grateful for them um, being here today. So bear with me for one second. All right, y'all are set and ready to go. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen really quickly. Um, my name is Maya. I use she, they pronouns. I am a former development director and board member at Respected, um, a current college student too. So I'm taking some time off in the near future to focus on my thesis and all of that stuff. But I'm really excited to continue working with Respect Ed and continue sharing sexuality education with the Lane County area. Um, Jade, do you want to introduce yourself really quickly? Yeah, hi, I'm Jade. I use he and they pronouns, um, and I'm the Outreach and Education Director at Respect Ed. Um, okay, great. Yeah, so as Brooke said, um, we're a local nonprofit doing work around peer education. Um, in terms of sexuality. Uh, we cover a wide range of topics, mostly including sexuality and gender diversity um, and sexual violence prevention in, our, in and around our local high schools and with a lot of youth in the community. Um, yeah, so just really quickly, um, if you're on Zoom, please make sure to mute yourself um, unless you're asking like a question or making a comment just so that we can control for ambient noise. Um, and then we'll also be doing anonymous questions. So if you have a question during this conversation, during this presentation, um, feel free to ask it in the chat, but also feel free to ask it through our anonymous questions link. Um, Jade just dropped the link, I believe. So you should be able to see it now. Uh, this is kind of from like how we really began. We started giving presentations in schools. And one of the things that we really liked about that was doing anonymous questions with our students. Um, so we would, at the end of each class, we would be like, hey, everybody needs to write something down. We don't really care what it is, but we want to make a space for everybody to have an opportunity to ask a question that they might be too nervous to ask out loud. So that's kind of our anonymous questions form where it originated from, but we think it's really fun to kind of do in all different types of settings. And if you want to participate that way, feel free to use that as well. Um, and then the last thing I just have to say is that we have some questions that separates kind of the discussion. So we have a couple slides that like we'll run through really quickly just because they have a question that we want you to be thinking out throughout the section. So you can kind of tell like where we're going to go in that conversation based on the question. Um, and since this is being live streamed in a lot of different places, we don't really have a ton of time. We can't really have discussion during the content, unfortunately, but we want to take questions at the end. And we also want people to have a space to share their answers to questions in the chat if they'd like. So free feel, feel free to use that um, to whatever extent you want. Um, yeah. And then my actual, my actual last thing is um, just a content warning for this entire presentation. I'll say we'll be talking a lot about sexual violence um, and potential and the resources around that specifically at FAIR. Um, so if you need to take a step 
away from this for a minute for the entire thing, feel free to do so. Um, yeah, we have some, I believe we have some resources on our website as well that Jade will be dropping later, um, having to do with uh, like how to support people through that. So feel free to do whatever you need to do. Um, we'll try and give kind of specific warnings and hopefully those questions will help to kind of guide that conversation of where we're going so that you can be prepared um, in case you do want to step away. So yeah, um, now I'm going to hand it over to Jade. Awesome. Yeah. And um, to folks who are participating on other live streams and who aren't on the Zoom meeting but are um, watching this workshop, um, we also have a uh, question form just through our website um, that, which is um, if you Google respect ed will come right up. Um, and you're also always welcome to submit questions about this workshop or um, anything else in there and we will get back to you over email. Um, and for whatever chat feature you have on the live stream you are on, feel free to have um, any discussion in it about the questions that we do pose during this presentation. Um, so Brooks gave us a fairly detailed um, intro, so you don't need to read everything on this slide, but um, mostly here we wanna say thank you so much to the fair for having us. Um, and we are um, really happy to be here and really happy to be involved. And we would love to keep teaching this content at the fair. Um, we love providing this content for free and all of our content to students um, and to youth is always free. Um, so I am adding our donation link um, to the chat. So um, folks can donate. And if you are elsewhere, that is just on our website and it is linked on the Community Village live stream page. Um, if you do want to give us a small donation just to make this kind of free programming and, and all of our other work um, available. So yeah, thanks everyone to being here. Um, and on this slide, we have some pictures of myself and one of our other team members who's not here today as a child at the fair, since we've all been involved for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So our first, the first conversation that we're kind of going to dive into is really defining consent and defining what that means both in everyday life and at FAIR. Um, so our first question for you all is what is consent? Feel free to answer in the chat, um, what, no matter what platform you're on, um, but I'll go ahead and dive into how we define consent and how the FAIR defines consent. Um, so how we define consent when we're talking with students is based on Planned Parenthood's FRIES graphic, um, which is a really great graphic that just kind of gives a pretty thorough definition of all of the different pieces of consent. So we have FRIES, which stands for freely given, reversible, informed, enthusiastic, and specific. Um, and a little bit later, we'll also be talking about sober consent. And so we kind of like to say fries has two S's, specific and sober. Um, but how we really define this is freely given means that nobody is being coerced. Um, you'll see that the FAIR policy uses the word uncoerced. That, that's really what freely given means. Um, reversible, which is this idea that somebody can change their mind during, before, whenever in a situation um, informed that they have all of the information they need to make the decision, enthusiastic that, you know, the thing, the very common consent saying that yes means yes, um, having enthusiastic bodily and verbal consent is really important and specific, which means that a person really, once again, like knows what they're, it, they're agreeing to and that there are like multiple steps of consent along the way. Um, and it's like a conversation and not just like a stepping stone to get to wherever a person wants to be. Um, so that's kind of how we view consent. FAIR also defines consent as being voluntary, informed, uncoerced agreement through words and actions that's freely given. Um, which a reasonable person would interpret as a willingness to participate in mutually agreed upon sexual acts. Um, and consensual sexual activity happens when each partner willingly and affirmatively, 
affirmatively chooses to participate. So once again, you see a lot of the words in bold um, kind of echo maybe in different words what this kind of graphic is saying are the pieces of consent. Yeah. Yeah, so we've been um, fairly impressed with the FAIR's consent policy. Um, I know having been involved with the FAIR for a long time, that um, a lot of us felt that it was a little overdue when they expanded that policy. But I think that um, compared to most events, most events of this sort, that it is fairly um, accurate and comprehensive. And so the FAIR does specifically address um, intoxicants and consent and um, defines basically this dynamic that an individual who's incapacitated is unable to consent and um, a person could have used drugs or alcohol and not necessarily be incapacitated. Um, they don't give a lot of guidance as to how to ensure consent in that situation, but they do establish a dynamic that we agree with and we're going to break down a little more um, how to make that um, call in in specifics and so that everyone can be sure and be safe um but i do like that they specifically acknowledge um those dynamics within the policy um and then feel free to talk about in the chat or or with anyone in reflection of this how how you can ensure consent under the influence um because it is certainly a bigger conversation than we can dive into here um so basically, especially um, as a group that works with young people, um, drugs and alcohol can make sexual situations more confusing. And the way that I tend to talk about that when we teach consent to high school students is like, when you're getting consent, you're trying to be 100% sure. And that can mean verbally asking someone. And it, you could sometimes just tell from their body language and their actions that they're totally invested in that. And you might not feel like you need to ask. But you want to get as close to 100% sure as you can. And obviously, you can't ever be 100% sure what someone else is thinking all the time. And so the difficulty, particularly with drugs and alcohol, are that they make that ability to be confident a little bit um, more difficult. And they take it down a notch. Um, and so it's not to say that you can't get sure enough you feel comfortable with the activity, but it's a little bit harder to find um, that confidence since there's a little bit more of a margin of error in how someone is feeling and how they might clearly act or express um, their boundaries in that. So some strategies that we found helpful to talk about in order to minimize harm and decrease the chance of violating someone's boundaries or accidentally sexually assaulting someone um, or, or being sexually assaulted are to discuss your plans ahead of time, um, including how intoxicated you'll be and what you'll anticipate being willing to consent to, um, checking in with each other before, during, and after, um, having a conversation about it the next day, and knowing yourself and your limits and checking in with yourself. Um, and so again, none of these things can eliminate risk, but they can make people more comfortable. And if and those boundaries are still something that you um, all decide for yourself. Um, yeah, and so the other, <laughs> The other analogy that, that was pointed out to, out to us by a former peer educator that I liked was just uh, kind of like driving, like know yourself and know your limits. And you can tell usually if someone is safe to drive when they've been drinking and if they're not safe to drive. Um, and if you're safe to drive and if someone else is. And a lot of times when we talk about sober consent with like 14 year olds, they're like, well, how do we know if someone's secretly drunk or if they've like, had a, had a drink before this. And it's like, well, that's probably not an issue in that situation. And so it's kind of, um, I think the way that we think about sobriety and driving is very similar. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just going to reiterate, like we, I think coming to kind of talking about how to minimize harm when there's alcohol and drugs involved um, was something that like was super difficult for us because it's, like in really when we started doing peer education, this was not really a conversation we could engage in at all. And it felt really harmful to tell students like this, not only should this not happen at all, but this never happens. And like, this is 
like this conversation about like being, if somebody isn't a hundred percent sober, then it's automatically assault becomes really damaging to people who have different experiences from that and who view their experiences differently. So I think coming to this conversation and recognizing how complex um, sober consent is and like what it means to be at a, at a place where sometimes people do engage in these activities, like is really important for us moving forward. Um, and yeah, I really love that analogy of driving because I think it makes a lot of sense when you, when you think about like what you personally are comfortable engaging in um, and what you might like, what types of, uh, what types of plans you can make with other people in terms of like discussing things ahead of time. Yeah. Awesome, thank you, Maya. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, consent outside the context of sex also, and um, especially in terms of talking with kids about consent. And um, we wanna emphasize here, like there's a lot of like love and positivity at the fair. And I think sometimes that can um, kind of conflict with a conversation about boundaries. And I think that, um, like we really believe that that those things like boundaries make um, that love and and touch that is wanted more accessible and more positive, um, and so, and and just acknowledging that some people don't like to be hugged or touched and that some people might be triggered by it. So if it's not routine for you to hug someone, like you don't see them regularly, it's not established that it never hurts to ask someone if that is okay with them. Um, and so I think like hugging is a really common one that comes up with that, but other situations that we thought of where applying affirmative consent, like by affirmative consent, we just mean an active um, opt into a situation and not um, an assumption or, or a passive. This is okay, but, but checking that you can hug someone, even if that's just like a body language thing, rather than um, just going right for it is um, so other situations that that's a good practice for at fair include hugging, touching someone, going to someone's camp, um, even making plans for later, um, and comforting someone who's overwhelmed or upset. That's always a situation I like to bring up when we talk to kids. Um, is like if someone is crying, then it feels really intuitive to like ask if you can hug them. And it's a really, I think, just like natural and intuitive example of asking for consent and asking about boundaries. Um, rather than just hugging someone who's crying if you don't know that that would be something that they would appreciate. Um, and then also just like being naked in front of people that you aren't normally. And obviously there are some situations that bear where by being in that space, that's an option and there are some places where it's not. And so keeping that in mind um, of just where that is and isn't appropriate. And um, yeah, these conversations are a really good way to introduce kids to consent in the context of fair and in the context of their whole lives and um, their bodily autonomy, especially with young ki kids, introducing them to the idea that like, they can choose if someone touches or hugs them and, and can um, have boundaries around that and provide their consent and have different preferences in different situations. Um, and I know, especially at fair, it's often really overstimulating for kids. so. They might not want to be hugged even if they're usually comfortable with that and um can be easier to have a conversation about like you can choose whether or not to hug someone and then also have a conversation about like inappropriate or predatory behavior kind of coupled with that just as an extension of their bodily autonomy yeah absolutely yeah um, and then these are basically just some resources for um, survivors of sexual violence um, or people who might be experiencing sexual violence while at FAIR. Um, in terms of reporting, you can definitely contact consent at OregonCountryFAIR.org. Um, Whitebird is also a great resource at Country Fair. Um, my dad used to work at Whitebird and, really, Whitebird and really loved it. So I think, I feel like we are so lucky to have that resource both in our community and at Fair. Um, and then there's also a reporting form available 
um, at the information booths. There's also one available at Quartermaster. Um, and then the other option is basically the authorities. So those are kind of a person's options in terms of reporting. Um, in terms of not reporting, there's SAS, which is Sexual Assault Support Services, which is located in Eugene. We really love SAS. Um, I believe Jade might be dropping their number or their address um, into the chat. And then there's also you know, a variety of therapy services in Eugene and in Lane County. And then there's also trusted friends and loved ones. So those are kind of the non-reporting options um, while at FAIR or after FAIR if somebody needs anything really. And so these are kind of, these are really great like kind of options in terms of the more like logistical and like authority reporting options. But there's also the fact that like, we should all be able to be there for each other, like as a community. Um, and so we also have some kind of tips and tricks for how to have a conversation if somebody uh, discloses to you that they've experienced sexual violence or they experience sexual violence specifically at FAIR. Um, these are great for like any time, but uh, especially when somebody is at FAIR, maybe away from um, a lot of their friends and loved ones, this might be especially helpful because um, I know that can be kind of overstimulating in general too. Um, so definitely uh, do say like, you're not alone. Um, there are people that can help. How can I support you? It's not your fault. Um, I'm glad you felt safe to tell me so I can be here for you. Um, definitely, we don't really ask questions like, why didn't you leave? Why were you there? Why were, were you drinking or why were you drinking and what were you wearing? These questions definitely can feel like victim blaming um, behavior and just not super helpful for people experiencing sexual violence. Um, I know a lot of times I'm a very like detail oriented person and like action plan, like what are we gonna do to fix this? I feel like supporting um, supporting my friends and peers who have experienced sexual violence has mean has meant stepping away from that and saying like y you're my priority and I want to support you in whatever way that means for you and that means like listening to your experience and listening to what you want to tell me and helping you in whatever way I can and not trying to find a solution to this or not trying to report this or anything like that so really staying away from like how you're feeling about it and what like what you would want to do to kind of fix the issue and really trying to just support the survivor and whatever they feel is their next step or however they're processing, processing it in the moment. Yeah, so we tend towards when we teach like kids trying to, to not kind of have these conversations about um, how to prevent things, like what individuals can do to keep themselves safe. Um, I think it often kind of feels like it is not directing conversation at the cause, um, but in this scenario, we feel like it's really important to talk about how people can stay safe, because obviously that is a consideration at the fair, um, kind of for everyone, and especially talking with kids. Um, but I just wanna acknowledge, like normally we don't, um, want to advocate a lot of those steps that that can feel victim blaming and telling people to like learn self defense and stuff like that because it's not um, it's not or it shouldn't be your own responsibility to to keep yourself safe in that way. Um, anyway, some some strategies at the fair that um, are helpful both for for kids and parents and just for everyone are um, first for everyone having communicating with your fair family about your plans and where you'll be when um not being out intoxicated alone um or or at least if you don't have your wits about you um keep an eye on your friends and their ability to consent and maintain their boundaries um and take time to check in with your fair family um people you're camping with your friends and make sure that they're doing okay and seeing if they need anything. Um, and then for parents specifically, um, talk to your kids and teenagers about consent, establish emergency protocols, um, particularly just where to find people when, um, since 
it can be hard to track people down when you need to. Um, so having emergency protocols, um, knowing how to find people and having a way to communicate, um, at least knowing where somebody will be at some time can be really helpful for that. Um, and then trying to be a resource and not a disciplinarian and talk to your teams about the purpose of regular check-ins um, in terms of being able to provide like making plans, resources, and safety. And that's something that the last two that we want to focus on a little bit more um, is that check-ins are really an opportunity to let teenagers feel supported at the fair. And I know um, in my own experience, like they can feel like a burden and they can also be really helpful. And I know even in my first year or two of being um, an adult and not camping with my family at the fair, that, that still having a time every day where I would go check in with my adult family who was there and have them just be like, no, you're all good, right? No one needs anything. And really being like, you're okay. Like think about it for a second, make sure there's nothing that we can do. Um, especially with having friends who like that might've been their first fair and might not have known what was available if they did need something. Um, and the more that, that that doesn't feel like it's something that like, you could get in trouble for the more likely you are to actually like share if you have a problem or if you do need something. Um, so I know that I was definitely at brief times like witness of disasters and like other teenagers like breaking up relationships at the fair and like being able to share that stuff with family members and like I had a friend break up with his girlfriend and need to like camp with us for a night and like we could talk about all of the like disaster that happens then um and not feel like we were up to something and so it can just provide a really useful resource um to be able to like direct your teens to the resources that they might need and not have thought to access um and then the other strategy that we have just like for 14 specifically um, is, it, and, and really for anyone, but especially for teenagers, it's just that the, the fair is not a good place to try something for the first time that you haven't done before. Um, and it's a place where a lot of times I think teenagers have, especially younger teenagers have a lot kind of more freedom and less supervision than they would in their day-to-day -day life. Um, and more time just like alone with their friends and, um, so it can feel like a really good time for kids to lose their virginity or like try drugs they haven't done before. And, and those are not great things to do for the first time at the fair, just since it is a very surreal and, and overstimulating place in a way that um, can bring a lot of positive, but um, it can make new experiences particularly overwhelming and a little bit hard to take a step back from before or after. And so, um, it's definitely, I think, good to to do stuff there that you have a little bit of context for how you'll feel afterwards and how you'll feel during. And if that is an experience you feel comfortable entering into there. Um, and then we want to acknowledge that, and, and I think we, we don't like in our idealist um, view of consent practices, like talking as much about predatory behavior, because um, it, it drives a lot of kind of negative and, and fear-based conversation, but um, I know particularly that the real threat of, of um, violence, especially towards towards children or, or women and people who are intoxicated being taken advantage of, a lot of that conversation can really like drive conversation with kids. And I know that like the first time that I was ever talked to about those topics and most of my friends was in the context of FAIR, that every year before the FAIR, we would have a conversation about it and the rest of the year, we didn't really. And um, I think that structuring it that way can become really scary without a lot of other context. And um, anyway, we want to we wanna acknowledge that like, there are people who have bad intentions at the fair. Um, it is a large event. There may be people who come in who are looking to take advantage of people. And especially since it's an event where people are so open and vulnerable and trusting. And um, that's so much of what makes the fair great. And it also can make people specifically 
kind of uniquely vulnerable. Um, so we want to say first that most incidents of sexual violence at the fair and in the world aren't caused by malice but miscommunication. Most incidents have people being intoxicated, not talking about consent clearly, and misunderstanding the other person's perspective. Um, so even within the fair, like when things do go wrong, it's usually not because anybody wants to harm someone else. Um, there are some people, not many, but there are some people at the fair who have ill intentions. And um, while it isn't the primary risk, um, and it's not something we want people to be paranoid about, a lot of these strategies are specifically kind of tailored to an awareness that that is a risk. And um, we hope can can help prevent them and in our experience has. Um, but also all these experience, um, these strategies and, and our other strategies around consent can, can help with all kinds of sexual violence. Um, both the ones that are kind of scarier and, and more statistically prevalent. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to add, I just wanted, I have, I think I have two things to add. I was just going to add like the, I think this kind of this difference between like predatory behavior and miscommunication, like they, I think that that's something that we talk about a lot and that this, the miscommunication side of sexual violence was what really led us to this work because I think both within FAIR and having those conversations every year as teenagers, like not too long ago, literally a year ago probably, <laughs> um, really led us to realize how much harm was being caused and how different people, two people who may have experienced what they thought was the same thing, like how different those experiences were for both of them and the harm that was caused because of it. So I think that miscommunication aspect is a really important um, part of expanding the conversation on consent and preventing sexual violence. And then I was just gonna say, whenever whenever we do the slide and talk about this, I always feel like such, like I feel like very old, but the reality is like, th these are entirely based on our experiences basically um, over the past 10 years, like being teenagers at FAIR. And so I think really like we, I feel, I feel like, very old and like I'm talking down to people when we do this but these are like directly based on our experiences um and yeah and we have been at the most recent time we were both at fair we were both teenagers <laughs> so yeah so um moving the conversation right along um what is bystander intervention um, and in short, it's another way that we can help keep the fair safe. Yeah, yeah. Bystander intervention is definitely one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, I think it is a great strategy. Um, so bystander intervention, you may have heard of it before. It's a strategy to prevent various types of violence, including bullying, sexual harassment, sexual assault, and intimate partner violence. We see a lot of different, recently we've seen a lot of different um, like bystander intervention tactics used um, to combat racism specifically. Um, we, we have always talked about it within the context of sexual violence, so that's the main context that we'll be talking about it within today, but I think it's a really great tactic to use just in your everyday life. Um, and I feel like for me personally, it took some practice getting used to, um, but once you do it a couple of times, once you intervene and make sure everybody in the situation is safe, um, it's, it's not that hard to do again. Um, and so, yeah, I love talking about bystander intervention. Um, there are a couple considerations before a person decides to intervene in a situation. Um, and before deciding to intervene, you should definitely take into consideration your safety, the safety of the target if you intervene, the anger and violence level of the harasser, your confidence in de-escalating the situation. Um, and then also just is is this something that you're sure about? It's better to risk being wrong about a situation than passively witness harassment. I think about this a lot 
I'm a college student. I witness a lot of college parties. I think about a lot when I see two people walking home together and one of them looks really intoxicated and the other doesn't. And like, maybe, maybe they're dating, maybe they're friends, maybe there is something else going on. And like, what does that mean to intervene in that situation and to just make sure that everything is fine um, and make sure that that person is getting home safe. Um, so that's kind of what we mean by risking being wrong about a situation. Um, and then also not being a hero. This isn't about putting a person in danger. Um, or being heroic, but about preventing violence. And sometimes that doesn't mean intervening as directly as you would if you're trying to come off heroic. So we'll definitely talk about a couple different strategies for that. Um, but these are kind of, those are kind of the considerations when I talk about, when I do like physical presentations, um, I used to do a thing where I would like stand because I'm pretty tall, I'm pretty big, I would say. Um, and I had a co-presenter who's almost a foot shorter than me. And so being able to be like, like, saying like, I, I feel like I have the maybe physical strength to put myself in between a situation if I had to. Um, and this person doesn't like thinking about that kind of safety level um, is really important as well as with identity um, and all of that stuff. So that's kind of, those are kind of the considerations that we take into account before deciding to intervene and also before deciding how to intervene. Um, so I'll talk about some of our strategies that we like to use. Uh, the first one is to confront to confront the harasser. Um, so this is a strategy that you should really only use if you feel absolutely safe and absolutely certain that this is the best way to do it. Um, if you think it would be helpful to confront the harasser and call them out on their behavior, maybe your friend is making a comment and you're like, that's not cool. Maybe it's as simple as that. Maybe it's also kind of standing in between that situation. Um, so confronting the harasser can look a lot of different ways. I would say that's the one that I feel most nervous about doing oftentimes. Um, but sometimes sometimes that can be helpful. And some people have maybe privilege or a mixture of identities that would enable them to do something like that. Um, the second one is to disrupt the situation. So this can be approaching the person being harassed as a friend um, or being like, hey, like, let's go to the bathroom, let's go here, kind of taking them out of the situation that they're in um, and making an excuse to kind of get the target away from the situation can be really helpful. Um, this is definitely one I use a lot because it's pretty easy and it's kind of just like, it's kind of just being like, hey, like, let's go, let's go over here. Let's go do this. Can I get you something like what do you need and really to make sure that they're okay. Um, and then the third one is providing aftercare. So maybe you entered a situation later. Um, maybe like you didn't feel okay to intervene in the moment. Um, but even after the harasser has left, it's really a, the best thing to check in with the person um, to make sure that they're okay. And then also to offer to accompany them to a safe space or a trusted friend, offering to walk them home, offering to bring them to their friend, wherever their friend is. Those can be really helpful to kind of make sure that that person, even though they experience something, gets home safe or is in a space where they can process what just happened. So I would definitely say the first two of kind of like confronting the harasser and disrupting the situation are things that are like done in the moment. But regardless of that, aftercare is definitely definitely really important and also really helpful in ultimately making sure that person is safe. So you can definitely like couple the two um, together, no matter which strategy you choose. Well, cool. so big switching gears here um, um, to what does gender inclusion look like at FAIR? And feel free to talk about that in the chat and to talk about it, um, to submit any additional questions to us from this section or to just have discussions and think about it after this presentation as well. Um, so the first uh, approach and component that we wanna talk about are just pronouns. So you might have noticed when we um, gave our introduction that we listed our pronouns, um and also have them on our little like zoom names um and so asking for pronouns is 
obviously a great strategy for respecting people's identity and understanding how to refer to them accurately in um, your life all the time. And particularly um, at fair with people um, dressing totally differently than they normally do and in a way that may or may not be reflective of their gender at all. Um, you really, you can never guess what someone's gender is with a lot of accuracy from looking at them, but at the fair, you really can't. Um, and we're gonna talk about that more. And so it's extra helpful to ask what people's pronouns are as you're meeting people or as you see people, people you know. And the other component of this um, that um, is particularly relevant to the fair is there are a lot of people that for, for folks who go to the fair every year, there are a lot of times people that you only see and have relationships with at the fair. And because you're only seeing people once every year or when the next fair happens in 2022, there are people that you will not have seen since um, 2019. And so it's totally possible that in that time, someone's pronouns or gender expression or gender identity could have changed since you last saw them. So it can be worth checking in and asking what their pronouns are. I know that um, I am trans and when um, there are a lot of people who have known me my entire life, but who I've only seen at the fair ever. And so um, it obviously like those people don't go through this like smooth process of like experiencing how like my gender presentation changed and like I changed um, the components that reflect that over time um, and, and reflect my gender over time and, and change my pronouns rather like they they knew me with very drastic changes across different years um, and didn't have time even to like get used to using a different name. So a lot of um, those, it can be extra good to just like check in and, and see. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so yeah, so we'll be talking a lot more about gender expression, particularly at FAIR. Um, these are just some questions to be thinking through as we move on. So if I see someone in a dress, does that mean they are a woman? And if I see someone's breasts, does that mean they're a woman? Um, yeah, so we'll be talking a little bit more about this on the next slide. Um, yeah, so gender re expression refers to the things that people do um, that are often associated with their gender. So this can mean clothes, mannerisms, speech patterns, makeup, um, all sorts of different things kind of go into a person's gender expression. As you can see, we have the little, um, like it's like a spectrum that goes kind of from masculine to feminine. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure many people feel this way, like not, most people don't identify as 100% feeling 100% feminine or expressing themselves 100% in a feminine way or 100% in a masculine way. So understanding that not only is gender identity like on a spectrum, but also gender expression falls under on a spectrum. And some people can conceive of their gender expression even outside of that spectrum as well. Um, so just some important reminders, you cannot assume that somebody's gender, um, you can't assume someone's gender based on their expression. And at the fair, you'll see people cross-dressing, wearing drag, um, and all sorts of different types of costumes that may or may not reflect their gender identity. So asking pronouns is really important to just make sure that you're like getting on the right track day one um, and really knowing that person's pronouns and making sure to really use those throughout the weekend um, and all of that. So yeah, um, let's see. Yeah, I think that about covers it. Do you have anything to add, Jade? So I was just gonna add, like, I know, um, like I have family friends who I grew up with who are like cisgender, straight, like married men who love to cross dress the whole fair, but that's the only place they ever do it. And if you knew them in another context, you hadn't seen them in a long time and you saw them there, it would be impossible to tell in that kind of example at a glance, like if they are if that if that is an expression of their identity at all right like at a glance they might look the same as them wearing women's clothing still identifying as men as if they were identifying as, as trans or non-binary now and you just <laughs> were learning this for the first time so then it can be good to like check in that situation how they want to be referred to um because like that's it that presentation that can look really similar can mean super different things 
Um, and that's kind of something that isn't as true in day-to-day life. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So without getting down a whole rabbit hole about this, because I know that we are touching on some really big topics very briefly, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of that second question um, prompting this section, and, and um, that leads us into bodies at FAIR. So people's bodies obviously come in all different shapes and sizes, and people's um, sexes are no exception to that and so like a person's sex is defined by a combination of physical traits that make up that like scientific biological definition right and um we are happy to share resources more about that topic if people want to get in contact with us but we're not going to dive into it a ton right now um but basically um people who are, are transgender or intersex often have different combinations of anatomy and secondary sex characteristics than the traditional male or female categories. And so a lot of times in your day-to-day life, you um, people are generally clothed around you, so you can make an assumption potentially of their gender based on what they're wearing, but you don't really get a lot beyond what they're wearing, a feedback around like, what their anatomy is that you can't readily see and at fair a lot of times you do get that like visual information that you don't usually have so it can feel I think a little more inviting to gender people clearly because you get kind of like a sense of what people's bodies are also like and we just want to call that into question a little bit as also not the best metric to um base how you're gendering someone off of um potentially like you could see trans people's bodies that might at a glance, put them in a gender that isn't accurate um, or, or might just be confusing to you if you're not, if you haven't spent a lot of time around trans or intersex people. Um, so the first thing, and obviously this doesn't just apply to people who are trans or intersex, but with everyone and, and with the way that nudity is at the fair, just reiterating that like nudity for anyone isn't an invitation to stare or ask invasive questions about people's bodies and like, when we talk about surgery scars, that applies just as much to just people with like an appendix surgery or, or a C-section scar or anything like that as um, who you might see as much as like people's, um, trans people's top surgery scars. And, and so just keeping in mind, um, not making people uncomfortable. And then we wanna talk about, um, it's obviously like, we don't at all wanna say that you shouldn't notice people's bodies because in that setting, you're going to, especially since we aren't really used to seeing it. Um, And there might be ways that people look that you're unfamiliar with. And that ability to see someone's body, just as it is in the day-to-day world, if someone um, is not wearing as much clothing as we generally expect them to, not an invitation to um, talk about their body or stare at them or or, make them kind of engage with you about it, that's still something that they have equal autonomy to as if they were clothed. Um, but I just wanna like, from, from my personal perspective too, I, as a trans person, I've had top surgery, so I have very obvious scars. Um, and I am generally shirtless at the fair. And I know when I'm walking around that um, it will catch people's eye. And that's not something for me to like be offended by. I know, and I, and I wanna acknowledge that like, you shouldn't not look. And I know when I see even other people with top surgery scars at the fair, it really catches my eye too. And I'll kind of like look for a second. Um, and, and even I have to like consciously prompt myself like to not stare at people or be weird about it um, in a way that um, it helps to be aware just that, that trans people are often more concerned about threats of violence than most people are. And so just being stared at can feel like someone might be about to harass you, even if they're not. Um, And so just being cognizant of like the way that you're looking at people and how that has the potential to make other people feel. And also talking like with kids at the fair about the fact that like people have all sorts of different bodies and they're not, they're not, they're not yours to look at just because they're on display, but at the same time, like obviously it is natural and okay to notice people as like, have your eyes linger there and, and just thinking about like not making people uncomfortable with that.
Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so this is, we've reached about the end of our time. Um, I think once again, Jade will probably drop the link for the anonymous question and in, form into the chat. Um, and people are also welcome to ask questions in the chat and we can try and get to them in the next 10 minutes or so. Um, but besides that, I just wanted to thank you all so much for being here. Um, Jade will make sure to drop once again our donation link in case you want to give us a donation. Um, we would really appreciate it. Again, we offer sex education through um, peer centered strategies in the Lane County and Oregon area, and we offer this for free. So really anything helps. Um, and besides that, uh, we'll just drop the link to our website. And we just wanna thank the fair so much for letting us be here. Um, we love giving this presentation and talking about this. Um, and I think Jade and I both are very huge fans of the fair. I'm really excited for it to return next year, hopefully to in-person. Um, so yeah, Jade, do you have anything to add to that? Um. Oh, just that our um, website and um, some info about us and our donation link are also available on the Community Village website in the little like program on the main page about us. Um, so that is a super easy way to find this. Um, and if you are not in access to our chat and we're happy to answer questions through there as well. Um, and also when we do have any fair events in person, my role within the fair currently um, is I'm at Rainbow Village in Community Village. And when I am working at the fair and when other folks are, mostly we are just answering questions um, and providing safe space for queer people and about queer and trans topics. So pretty much anything we covered in this topic today and we're located within Peace and Justice in Community Village. So any um, thing that we have had talked about today um, even if you end up with some questions about it next year, we are a resource that is there and is available to answer those questions within the physical fair as well. Okay, awesome. I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a couple minutes to see if there are any questions, um, Jade, and I'm sure you'll let me know, and then I'll stop sharing it in a couple minutes. That sounds good. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. I would also just add that, like, even if you think of a question, let's say you think of a question in like 10, 15 minutes and you're like, oh, shoot, I just missed the end of this. Feel free to still send it through our website. Um, we do typically answer questions on our on our website through we have a blog space there through our social media so there's a lot of different opportunities um, to kind of have questions answered and all of that yeah i also just wanted to say thank you again um, to the fair for having us here okay i'm gonna stop sharing Fair is fortunate to have you. Thank you for being here. That's great. Um, yeah, let's see if there's any questions from our audience out here. Um, and otherwise, I guess we can wrap up. Definitely look forward to in-person fair again. So I, I guess I have a question. Um, Go for it. So I heard earlier, you know, you see people walking home intoxicated and one person's intoxicated and the other person's not. And you kind of wonder like what's going on with that. What if, what if you see two intoxicated people? What are your kind of thoughts on consent when you're both intoxicated? Yeah. That that's a really tough situation and something that I think we also see a lot of. I I feel like most often when I see two people walking home. It, if it feel it feels more unsafe to me if they are if there is one person who is clearly more intoxicated than the other I think those are the situations where I feel like I really have to step in 
Um, when two people are intoxicated though, that's a really tough situation. Um, and something, something that like, we talk a lot about, like the context really matters in that situation. Um, and honestly, usually what it comes down to is there, it does, it's usually, there is usually one person who was more intoxicated than the other. And yeah, Jade, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I guess just, um, part of like when you talk about after um we talk about like I don't remember what it was titled but one of the strategies for bystander intervention um of the three that we teach is kind of um like distracting them and and talking and a lot of times like that's kind of the one we suggest if you're not sure what's going on is a lot of times like pretending that you know one of the people involved and being like oh hey do you need to do this thing now and so they have an out so so normally like if you're at a party or something pretending like that you had plans with that person later whether even if you didn't know them and then if they do feel uncomfortable they can take that out and if they don't they can just be like what are you talking about um or kind of like close that door and so um and I think that that's something that a lot of times feels a lot more like surprising to men and I think women are often already doing without having labeled it a strategy. Um, and that I've definitely like seen women do a lot without like knowing it's a formal bystander intervention strategy, but kind of like pretending someone's their friend and being like, oh, we were gonna go like, don't you need to be here? And then they have a chance to step away and, and consider um, what they were doing. And so I think that that can be a good strategy there, but I think a lot of times you just don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would also, I would just also add that I think regardless of like how intoxicated you think two people are, you should still get involved, especially because it is so easy to engage with intoxicated people oftentimes and to be like, hey, I know you from this and this, or do you go to this school or like, what are you guys doing tonight? And so being able to engage and kind of like suss out the situation and see you know, like where they're going, how everybody's feeling can be super helpful regardless of intoxication or who seems more intoxicated, but yeah. Yeah, and really it's a fair, people tend to be pretty delighted to talk to you. I was gonna say, that's a great point. <laughs> you make you, you've made your new best friend, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then at least you can see like what the dynamics look like. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I have another question if I can ask. Yeah. Um, so I heard you, Jay, talking about, you know, um, top surgery and having um, scars and people looking at that. I know this comes up in the Ritz too, when maybe, you know, what you thought somebody's genitals were, they're not. And so, you know, we were talking about this on the diversity committee panel before you all and kind of not, you know, using trans people as your personal sort of educational vehicle. And so I'm curious, like, what do you think that line is between like curiosity and casual observance and then really kind of causing harm to people and being a problem? Yeah, I think it's mostly just like, if you can ask people if they're comfortable talking about it or if they're comfortable mm -hmm. answering questions, because some people are in some settings and they're not in others. And I know I would feel much less safe, especially if I was caught alone at the risk than I would in the daytime at the fair answering people's questions and that would feel a lot more vulnerable. Um, and I know certainly not everyone has always had a great experience at the Ritz, but I was, I've was i been really shocked by how I have certainly had weirder interactions within the larger fair about being trans and people and I have never had anyone approach me at the Ritz I've definitely gotten a second look before but I have it has been shockingly normal and I've usually only gone in a large group of people which also helps um but that's something that that I don't know I definitely thought would be more of an issue and and of the other trans people I know who spent time there it's been surprisingly smooth <laughs> um compared to how I would have guessed that it would be and I was definitely like scared the first couple times that I was there just not knowing how it would go um and so I I think in that setting like it would be uncomfortable to like talk to anyone about like their body um just because there's a lot of vulnerability in that space um but I think within the fair and within the general life like asking questions even if you don't know someone I think it's a fair being able to be like hey is this okay for me to talk about is okay 
and I know, I don't know, that there's an ideal level of not looking at people that's not um, necessarily what happens in actuality. I know once that I was um, walking through the fair and, and this might actually happen several times, but once distinctly and like my um, like stepmom who I usually camp with <laughs> um was just like glancing talking to someone and just like glancing by at the path and only like realized it was me because my like scars caught her attention and then she like did a double take and was like oh Jade, like I just found you finally and so like I'm not I don't know I I think that I hesitate to be like you shouldn't really look at people because obviously like that kind of thing happens and I'm not like offended that it did um but just like letting people answer whatever question they are comfortable that's a great tip for folks to be better about you know instead of just launching into your questions and your tirade about whatever you think just like is this okay <laughs> how do you feel about this yeah i think that's yeah. a great thing to give to people yeah exactly and i think you can even ask a question and be like if you don't want to answer this that's fine and if people give me an out i'm usually going to be okay talking about it but if people just launch in i'm going to be like you are not entitled to this Cool. Well, any last thoughts before we wrap up with y'all? And full disclosure, I am also in Rainbow Village with Jade. Uh, <laughs> Jade works really hard and, you know, we do a lot of education there. Um, there's going to be a new kind of queer dedicated space, Rainbow Connection, um, at the next physical fair, which is super awesome. Um, we're kind of a tiny little sliver, so it'll be great to have a big booth um, as well as a BIPOC sanctuary. And we're really excited for those spaces to kind of build out and um, see what manifests there. I think that's going to be super helpful, both for education and also for queer folks and BIPOC folks to get a bit of a break sometimes from all those questions and, <laughs> you know, and be around like minded people who kind of get it um, already. So thank you for all the work you're doing. It's hugely important um, in our community. Appreciate you both. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. So bear with me here as we switch modes. Um, we are going to have Holistic Resistance up next. Super excited about that. Um, they're out of Seattle. Um, and first, I'm going to play a short little video here that our stream operator put together. Um, we had the diversity committee earlier today, and one of our members um, who was going to be on that panel discussion was not able to attend because her mother just passed. And, you know, it's we've lost a lot of people over the last year. Um, so we just want to take a second here to remember those we've lost and i'm going to share this video here in one second With open hearts, we make room for the celebration, the magic, the miracle, and the mystery, which are all alive and well and waiting for us to notice. <laughs> Cool. Thanks, y'all. Um, so we're going to take a short break here before Holistic Resistance.